welcome back for the third time because I really can't get the start of this one working. We want to do soil gel chemistry this time and soil gel chemistry is about getting an inorganic, maybe an inorganic organic hybrid material and making it. This is typically done by taking the organic substituted um, monomer of the inorganic framework and polymerizing it in solution. A typical version would be um, tetraethoxysilane or isopropyl uh, titanium. So for reference these are our molecules. This is methoxysilane, tetramethoxysilane drawn flat and this is diisopropoxy titanium also drawn flat. These are both liquids and very easy to handle. They're quite toxic but they're reasonably easy to handle as long as we exclude water and they will make titanium dioxide and silicon dioxide if we treat them properly. If we look at this molecule we can imagine that it could be attacked by a hydroxy ion and do very much the same as a carbon analogue would do, although carbon would not do anything in this state it would need to have a carbonyl group and then it would behave like an ester. Let's draw that quickly. So this is the ester or the carbon analogue. We need to store this electron somewhere which is done on this oxygen. It allows us to form an extra, so add an extra bond to our carbon and then this electron here kicks back in forming the double bond again and making and one of these two groups fall back off again. Typically this one because if the OH- minus fell back off again we get back to where we started. This is much the same but we don't need the double bond with the silicon because um, unlike carbon silicon has more orbitals to play with and so it can have a five member state where carbon has to play with its own electrons and its four bonded state it can only have a positive charge it is very difficult for carbon to have an extra bond. So we generate this five membered um, silicon compound with a hydroxy group and these methoxy groups and it's also got a negative charge which, can, which it can resolve by dropping off a methoxy. That can then steal a proton from water and make a new hydroxy and continue the process. There is a slight problem however as we increase the density of OHs on our silicon we make it less and less reactive because we're pulling the electron density away from the silicon which makes it more negatively charged. These OHs are more electron withdrawing than these methoxy groups. So that's going to slow the reaction down so we'll typically take one off and then take the next one off all of them and we might end up with um, about here, about half. This is now going to react at some, in some way with another one. Let's have two of those to form a dimer. So here is the second step of the reaction. We can see the uh, hydroxy group of this one silicic acid type molecule is attacking the silicon of another one. The problem with this reaction is the more electron withdrawing <coughs> we make the silicon the less likely this uh, oxygen is to attack but the better this one is at being attacked and the other way around the um, better we make this OH at attacking by making it more negative by feeding electron density in the less likely it is to be attacked so we end up in an impasse and we have to go or it typically runs via an acid or base catalyzed mechanism the problem being that if we protonate everything which will pull uh, which will pull electron density away that will make it all reactive on this side but unreactive on this side and if we have um, hydroxy groups then we will deprotonate everything and we will tend to make this more negative but then this one will not be reactive this chemistry is important from before where we were having silyl chlorides for example in paint or adhesive doing exactly the same reaction with a surface hydroxy group so then we would have an OH 
donating in the chloride falling off and ending up with this uh, attached to the surface ooh, sorry about that of aluminium or whatever it is so that will cause us to bind something to the surface and we've got an organic residue which we can connect to anything we want because these chemicals are very common and because of another use of these chemicals which is to make optic fibres if we want to make extremely pure glass with no other compounds in it the really the only way to do it is to convert the silicon into something that we can process in a normal chemistry manner the easiest things to process are liquids and gases because then we can um, distill them, we can filter them, we can do all kinds of things and so what we want is a liquid precursor to glass uh, silicon tetrachloride or these silanes with small amounts of organic compounds on them not these big ones, the small ones are ideal for making glass we can do the reaction that I just had and as it continues towards its completion we end up with only silicon and oxygen in there it's not the most efficient process because we've gone from a sand to a, an organic liquid and then we've gone back to sand effectively but it gives us the chance to take out all of the possible uh, uh, um, diluents all of the problem elements in there so that we can get pure glass otherwise we'd have to go to silicon and it's no easier as a consequence of that both these types of chemicals and these types of chemicals oops oh, OMEs for example they're short quicker to draw if we have the tetramethyl silane or these organic linked silanes these are relatively cheap because they are used in um, wafer so silicon wafer manufacture or um, optic fiber manufacture and here in paints and coatings so we can we, there is a big market so the price is relatively low and so we can have access to these type of chemicals reasonably cheaply to do other processes if we go back to our sol gel process where we are gradually generating a longer and longer chain of these molecules we can see in immediately a problem this is going to be a solid it's forming a longer and longer chain polymer so it will be a solid at some point but it's also generating a liquid the liquid is a mixture of water and methanol in this case depending on how many methoxy groups are on there still and how much water is on there we're going to have a mixture of water and methanol and it's probably impossible to get rid of the methanol anyway because how are we going to get it out of the solution without losing any of the things that we want so typically we will end up with a polymer that will go solid and a liquid and the question is how do they arrange themselves we can think of it as being like oil and water in a mixture so we start off with two things that don't mix very well together but they're mixed fully and then it demixes in some way so now we have to where's my room? there it is now we have to think of what can possibly happen the simplest obviously is that they can go into two layers so it can form two solids or in this case a sol gel, a solid and a liquid in the case of vinaigrette it would be two layers if you didn't mix it very well the next possibility is that it can form droplets so the um, one of the phases collects together into droplets and the other one collects together into uh, the matrix not the film but the outside bit in a vinaigrette sauce this would be exactly what you would expect so you'd expect the oil droplets to be in water or if you wanted to make butter or margarine it would be water droplets in oil this can happen exactly the same with the salt gel so we can have the polymer 
congregating together into little droplets which then go hard as they uh, cross-link enough to form a solid. It's how um, latex is made. Latex is polymer, little tiny polymer beads, or it's latex is used for two things. It's used for a tree product, but it's also used for tiny poly, uh, polymer beads that are made in this way. Um, if we make the particles like this, we will end up with very small particles of um, modified silica or some other metal suspended in water so we can make a colloid. This course isn't about making colloids so we're going to go to the next one. If we add more and more we might get the opposite effect where we trap the liquid inside but in between we get a third case which is more interesting. One way to explain what happens is if we take cylinders and we weld them all together. So we weld them together in three dimensions into a square cage. So this is a cylinder going in this direction for infinity. This is another one parallel and this is one at 90 degrees. So these ones, these three, and then there are ones that are vertical as well, all with the same spacing. So we end up with cubes and they're all connected together. If we weld these properly or we meld them completely so that they're actually on top of each other so this is a proper eight-way junction then we can imagine that all of the solid is connected together into one piece but also all of the liquid is connected together in one piece if we make this smaller and smaller we can get to something more like this where we've got a melded piece of bar which is this and in between we have a hole if we imagine what the hole looks like, interestingly it looks identical. So if we take this hole down here, we would have a grid of holes in a square pattern that is exactly the same pattern. And depending on the diameter of the bars compared to the diameter of the hole, the space, the size of the space, we can make them the same size even. They're not always the same size. It depends on how much liquid there is and how much solid there is. The two practical important features of this is that the solid is all connected together so it doesn't fall apart, but also the liquid is all connected together so that we can get it out if we want to. This means that we can dry the soil gel to get a solid to make optic fibers, for example, even though it contains an awful lot of solvent. So if we take this and we extract the liquid and then we heat it up and allow it to shrink and turn into a block, we can make an optic fiber out of it. If we make one that has larger pores, then we can make something that's porous. But instead of being a pile of sand or a um, filter bed or a, like paper, like fibers, it is instead supported holes, which is um, what the best way of filtering. So if we want to do it, make a filter or a chromatography column, this is the best way to do it, to use a what is called a bicontinuous phase. So we've got a continuous phase of liquid, which we've taken out, a continuous phase of solid, and then we can pass our new liquid through it um, and force it to go through all of the holes. Obviously, because it's likely to lose a lot of size when we take the liquid out, it is likely to crack and also it's going to shrink a lot. So we would like to counteract that maybe <coughs> if we want to make a block that stays the same. And to do that, we will need to remove any forces or reduce any forces on it that are trying to shrink it. The problem is that we've got very thin bits of solid that are being pulled by the surface tension of the liquid in the pores as it evaporates. So this liquid is evaporating and it's bending more and more and that will tend to pull these together. And it generates a gigantic force, particularly if it's got water in it, which has a very high surface tension. That will tend to crush our solid and cause it to turn into a powder. We can fix that by changing the surface tension of the liquid and if we do it to its ultimate conclusion we can ex exchange this with a liquid that we can make go supercritical which then 
by definition has no surface tension. We will think about that at a different time, but what I want to think about right now is possibilities for our coating. Because we can buy these silanes with different groups on the end, we can use the organic group to attach it to other organic chemicals. So we could use this double bond to attach to um, a double bond uh, containing substances by a uh, free radical reaction. Or we could use the normal silane coupling reaction to attach this to a, an oxide layer. So if we take a, a particle of, um, of aluminum oxide, an abrasive substance, a hard abrasive substance, we could attach it to this and use it as a filler in our soil gel material. Why is this important? It's important because then we can generate a hybrid material, a material that's got inorganic character, it's got a particle of inorganic material attached to it, and it's got organic character as well. The advantage of such materials is they're very resistant because the inorganic material is typically hard, or we can choose one that's hard, like aluminium oxide or zirconium dioxide, something like that. And we can also choose an organic material that will move around, so making it tougher. It's effectively the principle of bones and teeth. We've got a, an organic section that can move around so that it can absorb energy, and we have inorganic regions that, uh, that provide hardness and um, crush protection. Because if we take just a polymer, we can squeeze it out of form, but if we have a polymer with solid stone particles in it effectively, it's a lot harder to crush it. Then we generate a, ma a material that has properties that we want, to want it to have. One of the uses of these materials is coatings for knives and cooking utensils, because then we can make a coating that's relatively hard, but also water repellent, oil resistant. So we can put a fluorocarbon group on here and make it oil resistant, because it looks like Teflon, but we can put diamonds on here, for example, and make it really hard, so then if you scratch it, it laughs at you. 